Welcome to Talking Voiceovers, where we interview South Africa's voiceover professionals to inspire each other and newcomers. Today, we'll be talking to Louise Barnes, founder and CEO of Ear Candy, providing language services throughout Africa. Nice to meet you, Louise. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lovely surprise. So, Louise, tell us all about you and Ear Candy and how it got started and what it's all about. Ear Candy actually didn't start out as a dubbing facility. We started out as a a small post-production house. The business was actually started by my husband. He was a sound engineer. And, you know, for the first couple of years, we did a lot of commercial work, worked with all of the the big production houses and um, agencies and built up a reputation. 10 or so years ago, I got a call from somebody at MultiChoice who asked me if we dubbed. And I said, oh, I don't know. I'll have to check it out. Because at the time, I wasn't working full-time in the business. I went to Brett and I said, um, do we dab? And he said, are you crazy? I said, why? He said, it's effing hard. And I said, well, best we learn how because MultiChoice wants it. And that took us on a pretty insane journey where, so nobody dubbed in South Africa at the time. We then went to France. Nobody would actually show us what to do. So we'd kind of go from studio to studio and meet with people. And it was kind of fun. And so we came back and we were like, right, we're going to have to teach ourselves how to do this. So we went on a journey where we met some incredible people, directors and adapters and other professionals who'd worked with in the dubbing industry before. You know, we work with some directors who have been in the business literally for kind of 30, 40 years and, and we get to benefit from their from their expertise. So that's really how we started to dub. Eventually, content owners from across the world realized that they needed to connect to Africa and the most cost-effective way to do that was to localize their content. So we've grown over the last 10 years and we now have clients like Disney, Viacom CBS. We were the first Netflix accredited post-production studio in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're accredited to dub Swahili. And yeah, I mean, we've now become the world's leading language service provider in Africa. It's a pretty exciting and wonderful industry to work in, really. I thoroughly enjoy it. As we moved into the business and we became more of a of a dubbing facility so post kind of standard post fell by the wayside you know we would do we would do bits and pieces of commercials and a series we did a lot of work for bbc at one stage but actually dubbing has become our focus area because i think that's really important you know and i think that that's important for voiceover artists to also think about is that you know when you're going into business who is going to be your client and what is it that you really want to do? And so we made the decision to focus specifically on localization. And that's what brings us to where we are now. And what kind of projects do you dub? Oh, everything from animated series. So we've done things like The Lion Guard and Doc McStuffins for Disney. Um, at the moment, we dub the whole Nick Jr. channel uh, into Amharic for Ethiopia. This week, we've got a documentary that we're dubbing into Sutu. What else have we got on at the moment? We, we're dubbing a bunch of songs uh, into French and into Amharic. So we do everything from reality and drama through to documentaries, animation. So our whole, whole thing is about if you've got content that you need to connect to Africa, but it's in a language that your audience isn't going to understand, we're the people to help you connect that content. And you do all the language in Africa? Uh, yeah, we do everything out of Joburg. We now have 15 studios and five mixing rooms. And currently we dub here. But that model is starting to change. So what we're looking at doing is we're setting up studios in a variety of other areas so that we can then record voice then and bring it back here so that we can mix it. You know, as South Africans, we're so fortunate that technically we have a lot of skills that we're kind of ahead of the curve from a skills perspective, particularly when it comes to audio. So that's how we manage the quality so that everything goes out broadcast quality. So in South Africa, then the artists come into your studios to do the recordings. What happened with the pandemic? Did you manage to get recordings done remotely in home studios? As much as we would have loved to have followed that model, the majority 
majority of the talent that we work with didn't have the capacity and they didn't have the resources. So the majority of our work still happened in studio. So we were kind of closed for about four, four, five weeks. And then slowly but surely, as we ramped our projects back up, we would bring people in and we'd follow all of the necessary rules and regulations. But it's all going to depend on capacity. You know, if I need a cast of 20 people in Kosa, for example, I'm going to need 20 is because of voiceover artists who all have their own home studios. So practically that doesn't always work in our environment. On smaller projects, yes, we would definitely look as far as, as the technical aspect is concerned, but it's processing that kind of volume. It does become tricky. And when I spoke to my partner studios around the world, while a number of language services providers are, are, are pushing to re remote record, I think in our discipline, it's not going to become the thing that everybody does. You know, also from a skills perspective, dubbing is, it's not a 30 second commercial. You know, you're recording 40 minutes in an hour of content every day. So, you know, our, our director is going to need to sit on this side and get it to happen. And then there's also always the data issue, the line speed issue, you know, stability, what do people have as far as resources so we are still primarily following an, an in-studio model but that's not necessary to say that, that it won't change in the future in the studios do you get everybody in at the same time or do you record one character per session one character at a time so there, there are different styles of dubbing. The French follow that rule. So they'll get everybody into an open studio. They have a bar. So everybody kind of stands the same distance away from the mic. And they read something called a rhythma band. In the old days, a rhythm band was actually created and written by hand. Um, and there were different symbols and, and kind of stretched words and compressed words. And so that, that's how the French still dub. But we follow a different methodology. So everybody stands stays in their own studio. And that's why direction and performance is so important. And working together with your director so that you're mimicking what's happening on screen. So when we put everything together, that it all is a seamless recording. Do you use all 11 of the South African languages? Absolutely. Only one in 10 South Africans actually speak and understand understand English. So I think particularly when you live in Joburg and Cape Town, there is an assumption that English is the official language of South Africa because, you know, it's what the president speaks in his addresses and it's the language of business. But actually 25% of the South African population are first language in the home, it's the Zulu speakers, and then 25% of the population outside of home speak it as a lingua franca. There are 10 languages in sub-Saharan Africa that are spoken by 40% of the population. And the last two on that list, which are spoken by 12 million people and 8 million people, are Zulu and Kosa. So our business is about localizing content that's in one language that needs to go into another. You know, obviously, as language groups uh, get smaller, we'll, we'll work in them less. But we have worked in all 11 languages for South Africa. And how do you find the artists in the particular languages that you need for each project? <laughs> That's our ongoing challenge. So, you know, we're, we're constantly on the lookout and we look at a variety of different ways to find people. Obviously, Facebook and we are upping our social media presence to get people. But I get emails every single week uh, saying I'm a voiceover artist. How do I sign up? There are a lot of different ways that we look. For if you're enjoying this episode, give us a thumbs up. Do you use agents at all? Yes, a lot of the time. And, um, you know, I think that works out really well. You know, we're not adverse to, to working directly with people either. Obviously, as long as it's in line with their agent contract. And so you're happy for people who don't have agents to email you and send you a demo? Yes, I am. I think the caveat is that a lot of the time I get these emails that go, hi, I'm a voiceover artist. How do I work for you? And that for me is my biggest bugbear. You know, you're not telling me who you are, what you do, what your language areas are that you that you focus on specifically. So if you're going to apply, I'm less concerned about the quality of your demo necessarily, as long as I can hear your talent come through. You know, if you're recording something as a voice note, I'm absolutely fine with that. But show me that you can perform with your voice and give it to me in a language that I'm going to need. And then also, most importantly, don't pretend you speak all 10 languages or 11 languages. I only am interested in the languages that you are fluent in. Unless you're particularly unique, that's not going to be more than two. 
pick the ones that you're best at, that you're most comfortable in, and primarily that you can read, because dubbing is a lot about reading. Again, it's not a short commercial script. You're going to be in studio for between two and a half and four and a half hours, and all of that is reading lines, because you're going to get very little time to prepare. You've got to keep that in mind. You've got to be able to read in the language that we're dubbing in, and perform at the same time, because it's not a straight read. Do they need experience to apply to work with you, or do they need uh, no. coaching and drama and things like that? Not necessarily at all, as long as you're comfortable behind a mic. You know, some of the best people that we've had work with us, they came in, they've never, ever done it. For me, my primary thing is always going to be, can you speak a language? And then from there, whittle that down into who's got some kind of talent. And then we work with our directors to pull a performance out of you. But yeah, you don't have to have experience. That's our job. Our job is to pull the performance out. That's amazing. Super cool. You also take other language services like translators and... Translators. Oh my gosh. Excuse me. If you can't have a podcast without a child or a dog coming in, it makes it real. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, I'm afraid so. Um, Yes, translation, QC... Uh, we're looking for all of those types of people. So if you have those skills, you know, from a translation point of view, it's a game. It's about writing and being creative and understanding. I'm not interested in somebody who's going to Google translate my document for me. You've got to be able to, and you've got to watch the program and you've got to interpret it and weave the story through so that it makes sense to the localized audience. So then once they've emailed you and you've found them suitable, do you keep a database of all the, the voices that you like? For, you know, once people have given us permission to do that we will we'll hang on to their details you know in our world as well a lot of people move around so this week we're busy recording an ad project for netflix so ad is audio description which is another really cool discipline for for voiceover artists to focus on and it's it's essentially it's a a description track that runs through the program which enables blind and partially sighted viewers to get more of a sense of what's going on the talent that's recording it that for us this week she's actually moved back to to ladysmith so she she was traveling up from Ladysmith to come and do the work with us. So people do move around. So, you know, we'll always kind of check in. Are you still available? Are you still interested? Is this something that you do? And then we also have training sessions from time to time. So we'll we'll want to keep in contact with you like that. You know, we're, we're holding a training session. Would you like to come in? Right. Now, once you've picked a voice, what are your the do's and don'ts? Well, number one, be punctual. And when I book you, then arrive for your booking because it wastes time and money i then have a studio sitting open for half a day or a day and that's that's cost us money so that's the quickest way to alienate us you know just kind of professionalism across the board you're going to be going into a studio with an engineer and a director and the directors we work with are really really good at the moment sandy schultz is working with us so she is principal daniels on blood and water anybody's she's doing a lot of work with us at the moment we work with a lot of ex avda trained directors you know we're professionals and we expect you to be professionals so it's arrived prepared you know often you don't get the script beforehand but if we are able to give you the script beforehand that you know what's going on with dubbing you would be cast and it's all existing content so for example with all of the Nick Jr. stuff that we're dubbing at the moment if you know you're going to be Mayor Hamdinger and Paw Patrol then just go watch a couple of episodes and see what that character is about because it's going to help your performance as you move through so be prepared and give it your all you know once you climb in that booth it's it's an amazing world when you enter enter into a dubbing studio because you're essentially stepping out of yourself you're not able to use your body in your performance you're wanting the character that you're voicing to replicate exactly what's happening in the, in the original but in your language so it's about you know mimicking the nuances of what's happening in screen and showing the audience what that original character is feeling but in your own voice it's an extremely important discipline and I think worldwide you know dubbing actors in in, in Europe and in, in Latin America are they're viewed as huge celebrities you know, in their own countries, because once you're allocated a voice, that's your voice. You know, I was in a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago with the voice of Brad Pitt, the German Brad Pitt, the French 
Brad Pitt and the Italian, Brad Pitt. Sadly, none of them look like him. Um, <laughs> but that is their job. You know, they take on those characters and it doesn't matter how many movies come out, they are always that voice. So, you know, it's, an ex it's a really cool environment to hone your talent. Try out new voices. If it's a character voice, it's not just your run of the mill, quick, quick, get in and get out. There's a whole bunch of fun that can be had with that character and it enables you to get a lot better as a voiceover artist. It's about improving your read, your speed, your efficiency. Because we pay per recorded minute, obviously the faster and the more efficient you deliver, the better it's going to be for you. Because if you are able to, to record, you know, 45 minutes of good quality voiceover, that's to your benefit versus kind of just getting in and reading the line out where we can have to keep on retaking and retaking. So it's all sight reading. You don't get to practice the script beforehand. No. So you to practice the script beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. What words of advice would you give to somebody starting out in voiceover if they wanted to get into dubbing? I go back to what I was saying about the fact that only one in 10 South Africans speak English. You know, if, if you are really good at performing in, in Zulu or Kosa or Afrikaans or any of the other languages, then make that your niche. You know, figure out a niche and... and Practice it and just get really, really, really good at it. And practice reading. I think that that's actually the one thing that's quite particular to dubbing is you've got to be able to read and you've got to be able to read fluently and you've got to think and be that character in your head and in your heart while you're reading your script. So I think that those are probably the skills that you need most. Just like embrace it. This is not something that you kind of want to do as a part time. This is going to be your career. Make it your career. I think the reading thing comes back quite a lot, but you're really putting it forward because the scripts are so long. It's not just, okay, sight reading a, a 30 seconds. Well, I can do that. I can make a few mistakes, but this one, you've really got to keep going. Exactly. And making mistakes costs you money. The more fluent you are from a reading perspective, the easier the lines flow, the happier the director is going to be, and the more lines you're going to be able to record in a session. So this is very interesting because there's probably a misconception that a lot of the voiceovers are done in English for the big radio stations. But in fact, local languages are important and they're a, a big plus in the voiceover industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that they'll become more and more important. I'm really making it my mission from a mother tongue perspective to ensure that our clients are more educated on the value of creating or, or recreating content in the language that the audience not just understands, but that's their language. It's their mother tongue. It's what's in their heart. Because people don't want to be entertained in a language, you know, that they don't understand. And I think that that's why it's important that we start to do more mother tongue localization. The audience want to be entertained in their own language. And this gives the opportunity to do that from a cost effective point of view. That is really good for everyone to know. Do you use French voices too? Yes. Yay. All the time. <laughs> and French translators and French QC. We do it. I'm always looking for French. So Amazing. if anybody speaks French, that's great. Pretty sure we've got some viewers out Absolutely. there who do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. French, Afrikaans, Zulu, Kosa. You know, if you know anybody who speaks Swahili, Amharic. So the net is pretty wide. But yeah, I'm always looking for talent. So please get hold of us. We'd really appreciate it. Fabulous. You're going to get lots of emails. <laughs> Please do. We, you know, we're always looking for people. It's important to keep the content fresh. You know, sometimes you watch the Spanish telenovela channels and you, you eventually hear that everything sounds exactly the same because they're applying the same voices to every series. So the, the larger our talent pool is in each language, the better it is for the viewer at the end of the day because it's keeping it fresh for their ears. So yeah, please, I, I really encourage everybody to please send Trevor an email. He would love to hear from you and our where can people reach you to send you an email and find out more about dubbing? Well, you can send an email to our, uh, our talent coordinator. So that email address is Trevor, T-R-E-V-O-R, at earcandy, E-A-R-C-A-N-D-Y, dot C-O dot Z-A. And as I say, importantly in that mail, you need to be clear, even in the subject line, this is who I am. This is my gender, my approximate age. These are the key languages that I don't just speak, 
but I read as well. If you've got uh, an existing reel, awesome. Give us a link to that. If it's a voice note, it's it's better to give us something to work with uh, so we can add that. But, um, I'm not particular about if you don't have a professional reel, for me, it's not the end of the world. And what are your plans for the future? What are the projects that you've got coming up, if you can talk about them? So a lot of them we can't, unfortunately. It is one of the fun parts of trying to market when you can't actually tell people what, what you're working on. But, you know, there's a lot of work that is going to happen from a documentary point of view for local. I'm always looking for voices. And I think also what's important is to know that in my world, the sales cycle is really long. So because I contact you today to do a, a, a sample and, and, you know, that's what, how we ask the talent to work with us is that often we will be approached by somebody, a client in China or India who has a package channel. So that's going to extrapolate into a thousand hours of content a year. So it's going to be ongoing work for the talent. And I think that that's something that's really important well, it's the benefit of dubbing. So a project is generally going to be three to six months. If you're cast in a primary role, or even if you're coming back and back to do part characters, it's really great from a consistent earning point of view. And then, you know, when these package channels come in, which when they come, they're amazing. There's the opportunity to really kind of get into them and, and you know, earn great money over a period of a year. That's how to view it. So when I kind of say, are you interested in coming in to do a sample for me? You know, we try and get the client to pay for those samples so we can pay for you to come in. But on the odd occasion, it's something that our client views it as marketing. You know, they want to see that we can deliver on the quality. So what we ask of the talent is that they work together with us. And we are very particular. You know, if you've come in and you've read for a particular character, when that work comes in, that character is yours because it's got to be a two-way thing. And we're quite particular about that. Amazing. Thanks so much, Louise. Thanks, Gail. Thanks. Have a great day. You you too. Ciao. Thanks for watching Talking Voiceovers. We've got some really interesting stuff coming up in the next episodes. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell button so you don't miss any of them.